Well, good morning, everyone. Um, it's a, a distinct pleasure and honor this morning to have Professor Bazant from Northwestern University speaking to the RMA hydraulic fracturing technical community. And uh, Professor Bazant, uh, I indicated yesterday that I'd give a brief introduction and, and he cautioned me that he still wanted this full 45 minutes to speak. And that sort of says something about his background that it, it really could, it really is an amazing background. He was born and educated in Prague. He joined Northwestern University in 1969. And he's been the W.P. Murphy professor since 1990. And then starting in 2002, he's also been the McCormick Institute professor and the director of the Center for Concrete Geomaterials uh, from 1981 to 1987. He's been inducted in many, many distinguished organizations. I'll let you read those. It's amazing. He has seven honorary doctorates, has published nine textbooks, and uh, just um, um, a fantastic career. And I'm going to leave it at that. Um, we're, we're very pleased today to have Dr. Bazant speaking to our group. Thank you, John, for your generous, I must say, over generous introduction. It is my pleasure and privilege to present my views on using the current theoretical and computational mechanics to improve the control of hydraulic fracturing for gas and oil, which by the way, also promises spin-offs to deep sequestration of harmful fluids, including CO2. This is a mature and in the US, an immensely successful technology whose practice many listeners, certainly Sid Green and Mark Solinaman, know far better than I do. However, I firmly believe that theoretical mechanics can lead to significant and further advances, and I will attempt to make this point today. In the American Rock Mechanics Association, it will be superfluous to start by reviewing the technology. So I plunge right away into mechanics. My focus will be on the problems studied with my collaborators at Northwestern, whom I will introduce at the end. Wait a minute. It doesn't shift. I cannot move it. What happened? So try clicking on the screen and then the down arrow. Yeah, click down. Okay, it's all right. So first, what can be inferred from permeability and gas flow observed on the surface? Well, I we studied that seven years ago. I got some conclusions, which I still believe true. So uh, we imagine two cracks. Now many people think they are 10 meters apart uh, uh, or more as a distance of perforations. And there is gas in the nanopores, which diffuses to the cracks and then they flow, make bubbles and bigger bubbles and flow to the surface. So this can be simulated actually by hand calculations, linear, diff uh, one dimensional diffusion to the cracks. Uh, so that's one equation, Darcy law. I will not go into details. The mass conservation, transport of gas from crack system to the surface. Uh, that's again, an equation for the flux. It's a Hagen Poisson, Poisson law uh, for the flow of flow, uh, flow of cracks and the pipes also, mass balance, and we get some results. And that's what I want to show. So the results which were obtained that was published seven years ago uh, are here shown for five wells of fire shale. Uh, they are all scaled to maximum one. So it's the shape of the curve we are looking at, not the magnitudes. And in the shape are remarkably similar. Uh, what can be rather easily calculated half time. I don't try to uh, fit the end. That's more complicated would surely uh, require subcritical crack growth, uh, creep, osmotic pressure, and so forth, but this not. And now the point is that with a reasonable permeability that we measure, 
uh, we conclude that the crack spacing would have to be about 10 centimeters, 0.1 meter, with a half time uh, at about 26 months. Now, if the, if the spacing were 10 times bigger, one meter, you will get the green curve. If it's 10 meters, you are way out of the screen. And here the same thing is on the logarithmic scale. So I still believe this conclusion is correct, but there are, I will discuss the objections, natural cracks later on. So the implication is uh, that if this is true, that uh, must be 10, 10 centimeters spacing. And by the way, if the spacing was 10 meters, then the half time would be calculated 125,000 years. Uh, probability, or alternatively, we would have to increase probability 10,000 times. So the question is now how to achieve clock spacing if we believe that. And I will. All right, so there will be many simulations, and they actually did not answer this problem. They will be useful. Basically, single crack was studied very carefully, for example, by Detournay. Uh, with uh, flow and uh, singularity at the end, all of that. Uh, there were very interesting discrete discrete element simulations. I take it from various papers uh, from Itasca company, the Tournay is uh, Christine. Uh, cracks growing at distances 10 apart and they shadow each other, or, or right, a better call it bifurcation. Uh, okay, so. Uh, they have one property, they don't subdivide or branch to have smaller spacing. Uh, none, none of the calculations show that. Uh, and they also have the property that some even stop growing and you increase the spacing. That's popularly called stress shadow. So what prevents the uh, arresting of the cracks, the stress shadow and the localization of parallel hydraulic cracks. Now, one thing which uh, 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 we proposed uh, uh, seven years ago is to look at hydraulic thermal analogy, which is valid only if LEFM is valid. What do you mean? So if a half space which is cooled, we get cracks. And now we can imagine that we artificially close the cracks and freeze it. If we do that, we have to apply some tension. In this case, we have no stress factor, zero. And if we release the, the stresses, that's equivalent to pole pressure. So in this case, thermal crack and this one, we have exactly the same sensitive factor, energy release rate, uh, uh, except for uh, some uh, non singular fields which don't matter for fracture. So that's valid if LEFM is valid. Now, if we believe this analogy, then one can look at paper we did at Northwestern in 1977, cooling of a crack system. So if you, uh, cooling of a crack, cooling of a half space. So initially cracks start at a certain spacing, equally long, which is dictated heterogeneity and some other, I will not go into that. And then as they get certain lengths, uh, when the length is bigger than spacing, they subdivide, this crack close and stop. Then these close and stop, and eventually you get big spacing. Now that's a problem for cooling, of course, that destroyed the Joseph energy scheme from hot dry rock, because here the rate of flow by conduction would be acceptable, but here it grows with the square, eventually you get distance that is you get no heat out. Uh, by the way, this is valid only for the error function profile which is obtained from cooling, which is roughly parabolic. Now, parallel cracks can exist. Uh, this is a picture from my hike south of Yosemite. It's a stunning view just after Mammoth Mountain. Uh, cooled lava, uh, this is about 30 meters tall, these columns, uh, hexagonal, and they have grown parallel, did not subdivide, uh, and that's what we want to somehow achieve in our rock. And obviously this case was uh, taken a thousand years. There was probably, uh, it was not, not just cooling, it was mainly convection, such phenomena, otherwise it could not be explained, but it exists. So what is a fundamental approach to this? Uh, we need to start with free energy of the crack system, strain energy, 
and the energy of the cracks. I will not go into details. Eventually, you write the condition of stability, which, uh, which uh, means that the deriv matrix of the derivative of stasis factor of crack I with respect to crack J must be positive definite, and the eigenvector must also be admissible. For example, if crack is critical, it cannot shorten. All right, so this is, was analyzed. And uh, at that time, in 1970s, we obtained, and we, we asked the question, what if the cracks are not error function profile? This is, what if the profile is different? Maybe achieved by convection or some other means, uh, or uh, by pressure, of course, uh, in, in our case. So if the prof, uh, we get bifurcation points, starts of crack arrest, starts of stress shadowing, uh, and uh, when we get to profiles which are uh, uniform and then steeply down these two, there is no bifurcation. So in these cases, crack would go indefinitely, indefinitely, no stress shadow. And by the way, the stress shadow is an intuitive concept that doesn't answer the question, what is stress shadow here? Uh, you cannot say, you have to have already have the bifurcation. So bifurcation is a, the, is a correct approach, uh, predictive actually, stress shadow is not. Uh, then it was run uh, so, uh, several years ago by Salviato and Northwestern uh, for circular cracks from the horizontal line. Same picture. If uh, we uh, uh, if we have profiles of pressure like this, these are the pressure profiles in the circular cracks radially now. Uh, there is uh, uh, there is uh, uh, critical lengths put it here, there's a different kind of plot, uh, which means it, they will subdivide. But if you go to this profile, there is no subdivision. Crack, uh, these circular cracks will grow indefinitely if we have this kind of uh, pressure profile in the cracks. So pressure profile is actually one of the very important picture, uh, properties, which I summarize in this slide. So here error function to be avoided and somehow achieving pressure profiles like this. And there are various ways to help that. Now, computationally, how to model it? All right, so I reason ex explain later, proper approach is a diffuse crack front, which calls for crack band model. Uh, cra uh, we assume cracking distributed or uniformly over a final element. And it's with, of course, a material property that must be determined, determined separately. So we have a, a cubic element, uh, potential cracks. First, we have only Darcy flows through the cracks. Then we create the uh, fracture comes, open cracks. Then we have flux vectors in the various directions with the overall resultant. And this flow is now a Poisson flow. This is Darcy flow. and uh, uh, I will not go into detail, so you could then combine the flows, the right mass conservation, get overall equations, and let me go to the what uh, the next problem. So, uh, so that's one problem to calculate flow. The other problem is we must have good constitutive damage law for the crack band, otherwise we don't get visual predictions. I believe. The really good general one capable of many situations is the microplane model. And it must be anisotropic, which uh, was developed by Kunbali at Northwestern with me. Uh, it's obtained by spheros, so called spherocentric model. Now, in this model, we resolve the macro uh, continuum strain into uh, uh, strain components, vector and components, on planes of arbitrary orientation to the material. And the constitutive law is written vectorially to get stresses. And this is aided by physics because when you are in vectors, you can do constitutive of tensile cracking, you can think of frictional slip dilatancy, splitting, spreading, and it is important it's directional, by the way, just the writing relationship of uh, J2 and I1 and saying this is internal friction, that's not really sufficient because slip happens always at distinct orientations. He uses some slip somewhere, but doesn't tell anything. So this is then you get these uh, vectors of stress and they are combined by very short principle to get macro stress tensor. It's more computationally effective, but uh, people run now at, uh, at Wigsburg run programs with 50 million fun elements uh, using macro model for concrete. 
And this, uh, there are now two mic sets of microplanes. Microplanes are normal to the radial lines to the points on the of the dodecahedron, which gives the which gives a numerical scheme of the sphere. I will not go into details. Now, what is important also about this that one can manage a phenomena which are hard, maybe impossible to uh, get accurately by tensile models. For example, that compression stiffness uh, applied to shale, compression test to shale for specimens come at various orientations to the dip, uh, to the bedding gives a non-monotonic behavior. So this is specimen which is cut normal. This is uh, run in parallel and the stiffness goes down and up. It's a significant phenomenon and will not be captured by tensile models, but can be automatically predicted here. Now, how do you get from diffuse cracking to crack opening? That's okay. We know that at the end of uh, damage, of course, is no longer the uh, uniform. It localizes into a crack. So we write inelastic strain diffuse through the, through the width times characteristic length, which is the width of the element gives crack opening and subtract the elastic part and we get, uh, we get the crack openings. All right, so that's a, a standard procedure now. And how to deal next with the closing. Creep closing of, and I will focus on this question of natural cracks. These cracks happened in geologic past, 100 million years ago. So let's say we have two primary cracks from the perforations, 10 meters apart. And people uh, say, all right, we have natural cracking, which would increase probability 10,000 times. So let's say we have some cracks here and uh, there will be probably two systems like, here, like this here. And we calculate the rate of flow. And you see that uh, I will not give the result that was published. That uh, this, uh, no matter what you assume, you can get reasonable results. Uh, now, uh, more on the cracks. Are they open? That's the basic question. Now, if we take an outcrop, of course they are visible, like here. And if we take a core, we lose the confining stress of some 50 MPa, and then we see the cracks too. And you see one interesting point, there are about one, in this case, about 10 centimeters apart. And there are two systems, horizontal, vertical. So that's uh, uh, meshes with the prediction. Now, can these cracks be open? They formed by probably by shear and dilatancy some 150 to 150 million years ago, uh, but there is creep. So tests of creep on shale have been done so far only for some several hours. There are few tests going few weeks and not more. By the way, of concrete, there are tests that 30 years going on. So we know far better, if, but the analogy is probably not best. The analogy which I take is uh, uh, from geology is uh, with the uh, creep of the lithosphere as a whole. So it is known, for example, from the uplift uh, uh, after glaciation of the lithosphere uh, in North America, what is the average viscosity of the lithosphere? That's uh, available in books. And the, I take the average lithosphere of the lithosphere, but lithosphere includes uh, igneous rocks, granite, it includes sedimentary rocks. Surely the shale creeps far more, but anyway, it's a cautious estimate we make. And that's the secondary creep. If it's plotted, the primary creep is exponent of one third. It's not the same scale here vertically. Goes to eventually uh, to these lines, asymptotic. And they would predict ex extrapolation, but the law for obtained for one hour tests, we would conclude that cracks will never close. On the other hand, there's a primary, we would have the secondary creep, which goes to a viscous flow. Uh, and we, it's known already suggested by Maxwell, Maxwell time. The transition occurs at Maxwell time, roughly here. So that goes to steady state creep. The question is completely different. Exponent is low, but it is one, not about uh, one quarter, one third here. So 
Uh, and it is also logical to expect it because the creep mechanism is what? It is in most, uh, in all quasi-habitable materials is activation of some creep sites, highly stressed, which relax as the deformation goes on. Uh, but as the deformation continues, new creep sites are created. And uh, so for primary creep, you are relaxing it. So the rate is diminishing. Secondary creep is a constant rate. You, you relax as many sites as you create. It's finally steady state. And uh, that uh, must be so. And uh, uh, that's uh, what conference uh, agrees with other things. All right, so we take this law, essentially as part of the secondary creep, uh, exponent one of time. Uh, let's say we have a crack, which is, uh, it must be somehow propped uh, by asperities. So let's say the asperities are simply pillow walls compressed. And uh, that's, uh, we do final, final element analysis, uh, finite strain and calculate the closing. And the conclusion is that the crest must close with, within one million years. And the average age of these cracks is, well, if they form uh, one million years ago, yeah, that would work, but uh, it's unlikely because the shale is uh, 100 to 30 million years old. So, so most of the cracks are surely completely closed. We did also analysis uh, analytically with ellipsoidal elliptical cracks, which close like this, the result is the same. They close within one million years. But I must be careful. Can the pores close completely? I would say no. And the reason is that there is a surface tension in any pore or crack surfaces, crack surface, pore, surface tension. And to close the pore, you lose the surface energy. And the surface energy that you obtain uh, cannot exceed the work of pressure on the crack volume. Very simple calculation. I showed that the smallest pose possible is this, given by this formula, surface energy with a pore small that cannot be closed by outside pressure. No way. Uh, so, the pores conclusion is that pores for 50 nanometers are not closed or micro cracks. And that's important for the layers, the weak layers that remain after these cracks. By the way, uh, if there is air and getting complex, you get similar size limit too uh, by calculating from a, a, a perfect agile gas equation. So that brings us to pore mechanics or the hydraulic crack branching. Uh, I put here, I think from the website of Exxon, idealized uh, intuitive picture of cracking, but that's what we actually want, something like that. So we uh, consider that these, there are these cracks, uh, natural cracks are closed, uh, about 10 centimeters apart, but there are weak layers of pores that are not closed, nanoscale. And they provide permeability, that's important, but permeability is such that it can deliver water on a uh, transport uh, for a distance of a few millimeters, but they cannot deliver it for 10 meters. That would take millions of years. Uh, now, it is also important that these uh, layers uh, must be wide. Why? Because every fracture we'll discuss later must have a front width of which is finite, not a line crack. So it was damaged, but to begin with, as the crack propagated, and then uh, you created fracture. All right, another important point is uh, fluid solid phase interaction, which is uh, covered by pore mechanics. So we have total stress, fluid solid uh, continuum, the stress is solid, tensor, and pressure in the, in the pores. Uh, in, the, in the fluid and B coefficient B. Now B coefficient is normally taken as isotropic or just a number, but turns out if there is cracking, uh, there, there is always oriented. The tensor becomes highly anisotropic. And that was confirmed, for example, by Franz Ulrich Mighty for concrete. So we introduced B coefficient, which is not ten, which has not been done before to my knowledge which is a tensor. This is the inelastic strain from Craig Ben model. Uh, 
tensorial, and then compensated by this because exposed by one third total, one minus two thirds. And then what's happening that uh, this pressure acts on uh, on cracks, then uh, these are aligned with the natural crack, and then, uh, or a primary crack, the same thing, increases eventually when it breaks, you get full pressure applied, and then polymer mechanics covers all that. And now we simulate. Uh, so that was published uh, recently, two years ago in PNAS, uh, work of maybe Rahim Yagdam. So we assume three injection points here. And first, uh, we consider no natural weak layers. So when we get crack arrest, but, uh, and uh, these cracks grow, but we pump slowly enough that we can get parallel cracks. So this uh, it verifies both phenomena. Then uh, we assume a system of natural cracks which closed and left weak layers. Uh, these are black are the cracks of weak layers. This is a fun element system, inject at three points. Uh, and then uh, injection points uh, and uh, cracks grow. And you see you get lateral branching. And the lateral branching happens because of bio coefficient. And I will show some diagrams more for that. So we, we can get with a certain rate of injection and with this bio coefficient, we can get, we can produce cracks which are 10 centimeters apart. And I'm sure this already has been done in fracking, except it was done in a very small volume. That's the problem. But it is, it is happening now uh, uh, in, in the shale. Uh, now, uh, one can do some analytical considerations. So if you, for example, pressurize a crack, uh, then you find there is no tension. Uh, wait a minute, I lost the nicer pointer. Printer options, laser pointer. Where is it? Printer option. Okay, I have it. All right, so we get no tension in this case. However, if water is seeping in, it has gradients and gradients of pole pressure are so-called seepage forces, are body forces, well known from geotechnical engineering. That's what prevents uh, cofferdam to, uh, with a danger to pop cofferdam. Now they act outward and they give result in this way. Now this reduces the stress here, compressive, but it's not enough we calculate for creating actually tension, lateral branching. Uh, this is the formula for the seepage forces. Uh, this is uh, demonstrated here. So we have seepage forces only and without seepage forces, the stress parallel to the crack versus time evolves like this. It's compressive, this is zero above is the tension. Now, if we increase bio coefficient, but it is isotropic still, we never get tension here, uh, even, even if it goes to one on the cracks. Uh, so that will not create lateral branching. However, if you consider that there is bio coefficient, uh, there is expansion due to bio coefficient, which, which is necessarily consequence, the red dot expansion, uh, then you create a different picture. And if I plot the stress in the middle of the crack, parallel to the crack, uh, and there's this time, now you, the response curve goes for all the, even for 0 0.5 or one, the relative, relative value go to positive side. And because the material is damaged, any positive stress would start, uh, start opening another crack, any positive stress. So all these stresses, you must start opening lateral cracks. This must happen. Now, 3D simulations are uh, useful. And that was done in a collaboration with uh, Los Alamos, so mainly uh, with Wen Feng Li and is a group of Harry Viswanathan. Uh, so uh, first of all, they did three-dimensional simulations. This is actually very challenging. That means coupling of three-dimensional diffusion program, uh, anisotropic uh, with uh, 
three-dimensional uh, stress behavior. So this is a mesh in that example, for example, here. Uh, this is potential, not yet open hydraulic fracture. And if the, the wave coefficient is changing, you are creating lateral crack here. So this, uh, this constant B coefficient, you put the profile across the crack, uh, you see uh, there will be uh, no stress on the sides. It goes down to compression. But if the layer has a changing B coefficient, uh, then you create a zero tension, zero stress of tension. So cracks can open. Now, Wenfeng has run it for many cases. Uh, these are only some of the examples. Uh, uh, so, so not yet published in the report form now, uh, cracks. Uh, so this is for constant bioquivision, nothing happening in, in this potential layer, potential closed natural crack. And uh, this is in the other directions, changing bio coefficients in hybrid case. So it gives uh, conference what we have intuitively. Now he did many larger simulations. This is a larger scale. Uh, you start three-dimensional cracking. There's only one layer shown and that's how it grows and confer gives the same picture I discussed before. Then uh, they did in collaboration with us ex experiments on a material which is easy to handle, plaster. And plaster can control porosity. You put lots of water, it's very porous. You put little water, it's uh, stiff and low porosity. So uh, this is, we created a grid uh, with dividers and cast uh, low porosity plaster, low water content. And then we pulled out uh, the grid and filled the gaps with high porosity plaster, high water content. So that created weak layers in uh, of plus uh, within a, a stiff and a low, low permeability, but not zero permeability matrix. This is a setup. It was transverse loaded, a confining green provided confinement. And uh, this, these are results computations. So increasing, look at the increasing injection rate. This is telling. So if you increase injection rate, you uh, create eventually uh, uh, what we want, uh, uh, diffuse lateral branching. Uh, we have uh, these uh, uh, photographs. This was published in Geology of Physical Research with much more data. It goes sideways laterally and cracks grow in all directions and you create a system of cracks of all directions. Now, the last point uh, I want to make is the uh, use of line crack models, which is LEFM Griffiths, okay? Uh, and uh, what they mean with respect to permeability. So it is interesting that all fracture specimens used so far have negligible stress parallel to the crack. And people think that a crack running parallel to the crack has no effect on the field. Indeed, if it's a uniform field, you cut a crack, uh, stress does not change. However, every crack has a finite width. Uh, in concrete, several inches. In sea ice, far more. Uh, in composites, more. In metals, because of polycrystals, it's about three millimeters width. Uh, so, sorry, three nanometer, three, uh, three micrometer width. And that's important because obviously the crack parallel compression is an interact with zone, with the damage zone. So to, uh, this has been actually long suspected but never any clear tests. We found uh, a year ago, a year and a half ago uh, with Guyen and uh, Kusat is my colleague and uh, uh, Batiraj. We found a simple test, we call it gap test. Now in the gap test, you take the traditional three point band specimen but you put gaps at the ends. And also you could plus uh, elastoplastic pads here. So we use uh, polypropylene. Uh, so first we load and create compression prior to the crack. It's actually quite uniform. We checked it here. And uh, 
It is not perfectly plastic, but within the time of the fracture test, the rise is only four tenths of a percent negligible. This is how it looks for concrete. We have uh, specimens now for shale. We will be doing it for shale this summer. Uh, okay, so what is the advantage of this test? Now, the main advantage, the simplicity is that it is at the beginning, study determinate, there are gaps. But when the gaps close and this starts yielding, this is like external load, this is also statically determinate. So it is unambiguous in evaluation. If it is an indeterminate situation, you need to assume constitutive law, you have to simulate it, but this is direct, easily, easily interpreted. And the result is stunning. Actually, not unexpected, but uh, I thought, uh, but anyway. So this is fracture energy in mode one, relative to fracture energy at zero compression stress. Compression stress sigma is zero. Here, compre compre compression strength, so this one means compression limit. So as it's increasing, you about double the fracture energy. And when you get to high level values, you reduce it to zero. So this is actually happening. And these situations are many in practice, but not in fracture tests. So I think there is some correction needed. It really means that linear elastic fracture mechanics Griffiths is not applicable. It's, it's very instructive, intuitive. Cohesive correct model is not. XFM, which is based on LEFM, is not. Phase field, okay, there is a, some width of zone, but they put the damage load they have to, which uh, peaks in the middle by a line. So it's, it really, it's also actually LEFM equivalent to LEFM is not enough. Cannot model this. But Kragman model predicts that. We can probably fine tune this, but this was with no adaptation of only based on compression tests at different directions. Uh, this, this model, wait a minute, I lost again, oh, here. Uh, and we used uh, the microplane model, uh, M7 actually ferro cylindric. This is for concrete, so it was M7 without a cylinder. Uh, we, well, this is what we predict. The difference between the point, this is on the pad and there is slightly different stress uh, obtained at the, at the crack tip. So this is, this is the reality. Uh, it also, uh, we evaluate it by side effect method, which is the most widely used method for in concrete and geotechnical engineering for fracture testing now, uh, is the only method used uh, based on crack model at at uh, uh, uh model is the only one used at Boeing and Airbus now. Uh, so we can predict also the uh, size, the width of the process zone. This is the prediction and this is what we measure. So this, this also matches. And this is important to predict the width actually. Uh, and this is related to bio coefficient of course. Now, what is the prediction? We haven't tested yet for shale. So this is uh, crack normal to bedding and uh, which is a real case in the field, vertical cracks, horizontal bedding. And this is if the crack would be running parallel. Interesting in this case, there is almost no effect of compression, but at the end it goes to one, to, to zero strengths. This is a big effect, just like in concrete. This is, this peak is, so this is what we predict with the microplane model. We will see if this agrees with the experiment. Now, how is it explained physically? Uh, uh, we are working on a, uh, on a model, uh, but intuitively, it's a process zone. And uh, when you uh, find it, which has inclined cracks and parallel cracks, all kinds. Now on the inclined cracks, if you imply compression, you create static friction and interlock. So it doesn't slip. But if the friction becomes bigger, it slips. And when it slips, you get dilation, dilatancy, and it causes spreading and further weakening. It causes axial splitting. So this causes the strengthening, the static friction, and when it's the kinetic friction and the dilation, the latency, you get weakening. So that's the explanation that was published recently at uh, PNAS. Now, another phenomenon, you might say, all right, we use LEFM or phase field and we just change the fracture energy as we go. Well, that's not very good because this damage 
is highly non-proportional, high, highly pass dependent, much more than plasticity. So for example, when you have moderate compression, in various paths shown here is a stress versus a sensitive factor, parallel stress is a factor. Uh, you can do uh, stress first and then, then, then fracture. The other way you get differences about, about uh, 30%. If you have a higher stress, then you get enormous difference. So how can you do it by uh, without uh, looking at the, at the past, previous past? You cannot, you have to follow it. Uh, now, finally, uh, I want to mention various consequences of paramechanics that should be studied. So let's say this is uh, a crack, maybe primary crack, we introduce pressure enough, which is equal to tectonic stress, slightly higher to open it, obviously. And nothing, no change is happening here because uh, stress from rock is replaced by stressful fluid. No, no change. But the pressure by diffusion spreads in like this and eventually transfer the stress from fluid to solid. Uh, you still have equilibrium, but then if you unload, that's all is on solid and then you have big crack parallel stress. And uh, it is uh, about, uh, at three kilometer depth is about one half, one third of the strength. So that would certainly should cause some damage and that's probably part of the phenomenon also why we are getting gas out, uh, this poromechanical effect. Uh, uh, and that's something that of course can be uh, precisely calculated. My final slide, uh, I would like to, uh, it, would be in, uh, it would require another, another webinar, but it's an important point to make. We are now studying it, effects of osmotic pressure gradients. Now, uh, shale is full of salt, uh, salt ions, uh, sodium, also potassium, calcium. And when the salt uh, ions interact with water, uh, when there is a uh, uh, varying concentration, uh, they create uh, osmotic pressure. It is not a jump like in desalination by membrane, it is diffuse uh, the transition. So the gradient of osmotic pressure works on flow. It induces the flow of, uh, uh, flow of uh, water and water flows from low concentration to high concentration. That's why it's a minus. And pressure also causes flow, of course. This is permeability, this is kinematic viscosity and signs are opposite. So you see osmotic pressure works in a basic situation opposite and diminishes apparent permeability but it can be manipulated and it can, you can get also enhance it. Uh, so that's one thing that uh, will change the picture and it's probably also working out in favor of, uh, in favor of fracking. Another which is important for the later stage of fracking, you, you, uh, you saw the discrepancy calculations, uh, they really have to grow with time dependent growth, not time independent. The rate of crack growth, it's of course subcritical then, is some constant depending on water content uh, and on the concentration of ions, uh, thermal term and energy release rate, fracture energy and exponent uh, about them. Uh, so that's uh, also, will, uh, that's also can be calculated. It's probably important for the later stage of fracking or if you do uh, uh, unloading and reloading and that sort of things. So now I am at the end and I would like to summarize my main points. So crack spacing is 0.1 meter, but it is only a very tiny volume. We need to enlarge it. The natural cracks have closed, but nanopores weak layers remain. That's essential, they remain and they are nanopores. Poromechanics with anisotropic bio coefficient is essential and leads, must lead to let, let the crack branching. That's uh, Fracture process zone is not a fracture is not a line. It has a width, finite width that matters, and for because of this, crack parallel stresses. I talk of compression, the parallel, but also transverse compression has similar effect. We showed she also. They all change the picture, and they can be taken account by crack band model. 
maybe non-local models, but they really are not uh, feasible for large practical rules. Uh, uh, their effect of these crackpot stresses is reproduced by crackpot model. Essentially, it's realistic damage law. You cannot do just simple uh, more Coulomb. Uh, we, we tried that actually. It uh, does not give good, good enough prediction. And uh, line crack models are unrealistic, are uh, in instructive. Yes, we cannot forget fracture mechanics, but for complete predictions, uh, they can be misleading. So, with this, uh, I would like to acknowledge my outstanding collaborators. Huang Duyen, uh, who is uh, uh, will be defending his PhD in the fall, and uh, will be looking for a position, of course, in, in research. Wen Feng Li, who is at Los Alamos, a postdoc, uh, he did all these 3D simulations and also did the experiments on uh, branching and plaster, and Said Rahim Agdam, who did much of this work. He left, he defended a year ago, ago and uh, his PH, PhD and is now at Seismos in Austin, uh, 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 consulting company for fracking. Uh, thank you for listening. And, and thank you for a, a far reaching and very, very provocative <laughs> presentation. Thank you so much. Uh, we, we do have a number of questions and we've got about 15 minutes for questions. The first is from Alexei Savitsky from Shell. And um, he's interested in your slide where you were um, showing the half time. Um, and he, he said, Professor Bazant, in your simulations, did you consider decrease of permeability, fracture conductivity and near, con near well bore conductivity with the depletion? And, and Dr. Savitsky, um, he, he expects that these effects would strongly impact the half time and, and in fact shorten it. Yeah, we play with permeability. Of course, if you change permeability, uh, if you increase it enough, you match it for different crack spacing. It goes opposite each, each way. I didn't show it here, but uh, actually, uh, this is effect of crack spacing, but probably a similar effect. So yes, uh, but uh, I believe we don't have that permeability, which people infer from natural cracks. Uh, these cracks are closed. So uh, yes, I fully agree. Permeability will change the picture completely, but the, the natural cracks at the depths of sigmoid are closed. That's that's follows from analysis of creep closing. Does it answer your question, Alexei? Sorry, I was trying to unmute. Uh, maybe not exactly. Let, let me uh, uh, rephrase it. I'm looking at decline. So there is a normalized peak at the beginning, and then oh, okay, there's so. a half time. So I'm just saying that the accelerated decline in production rates can yes. be caused by a loss of initial permeability as we deplete, uh, as pressure decreases in the matrix, in fractures, and near well bone. I think you are right. They will play a role too, but I think uh, uh, time dependent crack growth, subcritical would play a role and creep would also in this. But you are certainly right. Okay. Thank you. Uh, but we did uh, not try to measure this. I uh, made point, I try to focus only on the half time. It's not, uh, this phenomena will not come to play here yet, I think. Okay, so on these plots, uh, uh, these flow properties are not uh, dependent on pressure. Uh, okay. They are not dependent on pressure, and they are scaled zero to one. If they, if you take absolute value, they are, of course. But in relative term, please, this is not actual, uh, actual flux that's scaled to one. And pressures were different, different wells. That's all in relative terms. Okay, that's that's a Thank you. I, I should have emphasized. Yes. Um, thanks, Alexei. Um, and and you, Mas Pashad. Um, uh, it has a similar question, and, and he's interested in, in uh, your thoughts on permeability and isotropy, and and how they may come into play in any of in any of the um, analytical considerations that and, or numerical considerations. So, what is the question exactly? 
um, in a shale-like environment, fracture and matrix permeability would be distinct. Further, permeability being anisotropic in nature, say vertical versus horizontal. So he, he's, he's wondering, can, these comp can this complex nature of permeability be modeled satisfactorily? So uh, permeability- Yeah, that's surely important because permeability it, uh, transfers to bedding is uh, much lower than along the bedding, yes. And uh, uh, Rahimi uh, took that into account in simulations. It's easy to set in five elements. Uh, uh, directional permeability, uh, with a permeability tensor, and I believe uh, in Los Alamos family also did the same thing. So yes, I didn't mention this as a good point. I should have mentioned, uh, but uh, anisotropy matters. And, and and Mark McClure has 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 an observation based on some recent field testing, and he's he's wondering if you've been able to had a, an opportunity to consider those. There's, there's hydraulic fracturing um, HF TS1 and TS2. So those were field projects. Yes. And, and, and there, was core th there was core taken through the fractures and, and to, to observe the fracture geometry. And these direct physical measurements do not observe lateral branching off of the hydraulic fractures. Um, and, and maybe you could, just address that um, if you could. Well, I believe the, the lateral branching as a close by cracks uh, occur in very small volume. And if you don't hit that volume, you don't see it. Uh, uh, this, uh, I am not sure I don't uh, remember uh, where was, was they measured, but uh, I mean to, uh, to say that they don't exist would be too daring. Uh, you would have to scan the volume and uh, uh, it, requ it requires more work. I, I mean, that's an important point to consider, yes. I, I think we cannot answer this time. Because the measurements are done in a certain location and what, uh, what about uh, next nearby locations? Anyway, a large volume could not have been fractured because then the flux will be completely different. We, we leave, we get out uh, maybe some 5% of the gas out of from the formation or even less. So, so I, I think actually the opinions expressed are consistent between you and Mark. I, I mean, that's, that's and, and Mark has, has a follow on that, that he, he points out that um, the core through studies do not observe crack spacing of 0.1 meters and and uh, they routinely industrially they, they can match production data with uh, uh, with uh, many diagnostics with fractures spaced more than 10 feet apart well okay so then uh, if they are right then my analysis is wrong <laughs> <laughs> uh, but i think that it, it, it's a it's supported by many facts, actual experimental two observations. Uh, uh, then they have some, how do you explain permeability at the distance, spacing of 10 meters or one meter? I don't know. Yeah. They claim these cracks are open. And does uh, creep does not, shell does not creep. So, so Mark, do you want to uh, address that? Um, I'm sure. Yeah. I mean, you know, we use diagnostic fracture injection tests to measure permeability directly in situ. Uh, and we take those permeabilities and we put them in models that use crack spacing, you know, more than 10 feet and, and they're consistent with, with the production data. So um, I, I just, I don't know. I, I couldn't follow the argument that crack spacing needs to be 10 centimeters. Well, that's, uh, there are some questions about in situ permeability. As you pressurize one crack measure on another crack, uh, do, do you ever obtain a steady state flow, for example, or do you analyze it as a transient? There are many questions about these tests. That, uh, I didn't work on it, but that's what I heard in discussions. Okay, anyway, thank you. Excellent. Uh, now, Panos had an observation, and, and actually, I think you had some slides may, maybe that showed this after he, he pointed this out, but that the, he, he, he's, he, he's uh, in, in agreement about the parallel stress and that uh, that also uh, uh, yields the material in shield and that shields the fracture tip. Yes. So the question is what? 
Uh, I, I think it, it was an observation in, in concurrence. Um, and, and here's another one. The crack band model still models the process zone in a narrow band. The influence of inelastic deformation is a much wider zone. W would you like to comment on that? Comment? Yes, of course. That's a good point. Right? Actually, there are very good papers, especially from Japan observations. Cracks are uh, in the process zone are dense close to the tip, the less dense is statistical and eventually spread much wider. So we, for the global behavior, we lump here uh, 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 fracking, which is uh, micro cracking, which is uh, decaying from the crack line into one rectangular profile. That's a simplification. It has been shown that for global predictions, does many things correctly. Size effects, uh, overall behavior is not good enough locally. Now for that, we have models too, but they are very complicated to program, uh, non-local models, but even non-local models as they exist, they have only one characteristic length. Actually, they would have to be different in different directions. That's not, that does not exist. Yeah, that's, a, that's actually a subject for further research. Right. But uh, there's experience which people denied, but in concrete, in composites, uh, aircraft composites, this Kirkman model gives very good predictions. And talk to people like Vas or Salviato or I don't know, uh, uh, who have uh, lots of experience with it. And yes, the, the, this cracking and then jump to zero is a simplification, but it is better than simplification in line. Far better. And we have a, we have a question from Mustafa Mosbacher. And, and, and Mustafa would like you to elaborate on, on a little bit on, on talking about the, the appropriateness of various different models as, as you, you did a little bit. And so his general question is, in your opinion, <coughs> how do you see the potential of continuing, continuing damage and phase field modeling for modeling fracturing? And what are the challenges? Well, I, I was invited to give a lecture at ASME plenary, which I will focus on phase field models. Phase model is a wonderful thing, but has works only for something. It's basically linear elastic fracture mechanics. It has this damage parameter, uh, which is a single parameter for damage. That's inadequate. I mean, Gregor model has about uh, 20 parameters. And we try to combine Gregor model with phase field uh, it does, it's, uh, it's preposterously complicated. It does not work. Uh, now, in, uh, with that single parameter, they cannot distinguish uh, crack uh, stress part to surface. There are many demonstrations of crack band model, especially dynamic, is wonderful for dynamics, of course, with a very fine mesh, I must say, very complicated, expensive, but no crack power stresses. They have not compared it. We are running now comparisons, actually, with, uh, we have a phase field program and uh, effect is enormous. It's, uh, they can, uh, which, uh, which is not reproduced. So, I mean, phase field model is outstanding for certain things, but it's not a general model. It's not better. It's basically Griffith's model, which can run any way, any direction and uh, ignoring uh, crack power stress. And uh, yeah. of course it was not conceived for fracture. It was conceived initially 50 years ago for Phase transformation, scale, scale. Now, if you, if you go to damage, uh, as done by Aronson 21 years ago, so that's a different picture. I think it's a very interesting line of investigation, but uh, to be predictive, no. I mean, people tried it even for fra fra fracturing. I don't believe that. Um, and, and we have an observation from Professor Solomon, and, and they're ganging up on you, Professor Bazant. He said he's found the same thing that Mark McClure was talking about in terms of fracture spacing and similar issues. So, Professor Solomon, do you want to say anything? Sure. We, we have done uh, similar to what uh, Mark McClure has said, and we did that actually several years ago. I'm talking about in early 2000s, 2005, 2006, analyzed the fracturing data in, uh, in multiple shale formation, uh, especially in Barnett shale. And we calculated probability using testing. 
Then we match data and the data we match was not only gas production, but we actually matched gas rate and water rate. And as well as, of course, once you match the rate, you, your match with the cumulative production is, is obviously there. So rather than just matching cumulative production, we match the rates, which, uh, and we, we were talking about um, the different distance between fractures that we had was in excess of 10 feet, a lot more than 10 feet. We're talking about maybe closer to 50 feet. So uh, th there may be presence of natural fractures that, uh, that uh, helped in, in, that, in that match, obviously. So what we have here is we have a great opportunity for additional collaboration. Uh, and, I, and, and I believe debate. this is valid, uh, what you say, uh, Mike, but uh, is it sure if these cracks, uh, let's say 30 feet apart or 10 feet uh, apart, 10 meters apart, uh, next to these cracks, don't you have locally uh, a set of cracks which open up? They are small, small openings, you know, and uh, uh, I don't know, it's, uh, it's, uh, these are points to consider what, uh, whether the one can make firm inferences from that or just intuitive. Uh, yeah. These are important observations, I, I know, but. Uh, uh, um, um, maybe uh, uh, yeah. I could give, Wen Fong ha has, has a couple of comments. Wen Fong, are you online? Would you like to, uh, would you like to respond to? You have a couple of things in the chat. Yeah, so can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, it's a, it's a follow-up response to, to people's question regarding the branching observation uh, in the field. So actually at the hydraulic fracturing test site, I'm thinking because branching does not happen necessarily, whatever injection rate you use under whatever reservoir conditions, it does need a proper injection design and stress, uh, in situ stress stresses, and also the reservoir heterogeneity. So, so my feeling is uh, and the hydraulic fracturing test site, I'm not sure whether the injection design and the reservoir conditions meet the hydraulic fracture, uh, uh, fracture branching requirement or not. So um, that's just my concern. Uh, basically, they also mentioned uh, like uh, other, other sites and, and different sites that they retrieved the uh, cores from subsurface. They did not ob observe fracture branching. Um, yeah, um, so I couldn't respond to that, but uh, what I can say is uh, we are running, we are planning to run hydraulic fracturing experiment in the laboratory with uh, uh, a horizontal stress and isotropy and also the pre-existing weak layers. Um, so we want to test uh, how the injection design uh, compared with the reservoir conditions uh, so we can promote hydraulic fracture branching. Um, so hopefully we can share these with us uh, very soon. We, we, yeah. we look for- well, we thank will. These are good points, of course, I agree. There are many things to explore, uh, anisotropy simulated in the experiment. Uh, injection rates, what if you stop? Is actually uh, much is known in practice, uh, uh, effect of how, uh, uh, injection rate changes, uh, uh, reducing the pressure, repressurizing, all this uh, creates different pressure profiles. And, uh, and all this needs to be actually calculated. My point is that you need calculations. I mean, I, I believe what you say and experiments that you know are very illuminating. I, I, I think that that's a very uh, profound way to end this really great discussion. And, and tremendous presentation. Um, in the interest of time, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna have to call an end to the questions and just express our sincere thanks to Dr. Bazant. Um, for, for the attendees, if, if you uh, want a recording of this, just drop me a note. Um, uh, this is John McLennan. And uh, to receive further announcements of, uh, of other upcoming seminars, uh, um, 
please join the ARMA hydraulic fracturing technical community and we'll add you to the mailing list. So if, if you're interested in that, drop me a note as well. Again, our, our thanks to everyone for their, their, for their participation and particularly to Dr. Bazant for uh, really um, uh, a very provocative presentation. And, and, and thanks again. Thanks everybody. And thanks for the discussions.